The last big bit of this course takes us away from the world of external audit, where we are checking sets of financial statements to see if they're true and fair, and looks at the other things that firms of accountants tend to get up to that are related to audit. If you are to go into a big firm of accountants and look for the audit department, you may find that the audit department is now called the assurance department. And that's meant to be a recognition that the department is no longer just doing audits. It's doing other things as well. As big firms of accountants have tried to widen the range of services they're able to provide, so the exam process needs to recognise that fact and accept it. And that's why this is not just an advanced audit exam. We also need to look at some of the other services that accountants and auditors may provide. Now, this does create a slight challenge for us because there is a very long list of potential services that an audit firm may provide to clients. What we need to know for the purpose of the exam is an idea of the sort of services that exist. There's a small number of them that you need to know in a bit more detail, maybe actually describing how you might provide those services. And then there are some general issues affecting all of the services we provide, and we need to look at those as well. In order to understand services other than the external audit, let's start with the external audit and just take a look at one or two things about it. We can then compare the other assignments with the audit. With the external audit, we as accountants are doing some very detailed work. Why are we doing such detailed work? Well, because we are required in an audit report to provide a fairly detailed statement that says either the accounts are true and fair, they're not true and fair, or that they're true and fair except for certain issues. So because we have to provide a fairly detailed opinion, what is known as positive assurance, which is fairly high level of assurance, we have to do a fairly high level of work. Of course, the external audit process is also very heavily regulated. We know how to do an external audit because there's a series of auditing standards that we're required to follow. So there are a few basic things about the external audit that we know. What about all these other services? Well, as I said, the external audit has a relatively high level of assurance. There are some services we provide which potentially have no assurance whatsoever. So let's now look at the other end of the range at zero assurance. Now, what do I mean by no assurance? Well, by no assurance, what I basically mean is no opinion is going to be given about something.
And one example of this is known as a compilation. So what is a compilation assignment? Well, the classic example of this is where a company hands me their trial balance, so they've already put all the debits and credits into the system, they hand me the list of all the accounts with debits and all the accounts with credits, and then say they're not too sure about what a proper set of financial statements looks like, can I rearrange all of the numbers and put them into the right places? Now, of course, I'm able to do that as an accountant, but once I've finished, and the numbers that I've been t and put them where I think they should go. If it says sales $5 million, I've not checked that that's the right number, have I? And in fact, I've not even checked that those $5 million are sales. It might have been purchases. Exactly what I've Hit the numbers, put the format. As a result of this, whilst I'm confident that the layout of the accounts is right, cannot say that the results are in way I check them, have I? I haven't checked them at all. Because no assurance has been given with this assignment, this compilation exercise, it's very important that the accountant who does it puts a little report on the account that says, all we've done is taken the numbers given to us by the client and put them in an appropriate format. No checking has been done, no audit work has been done, and as such, no assurance is provided. Because when people see the name of a firm of accountants, on a set of accounts, the natural assumption is that the firm of accountants have either checked the numbers or, in fact, prepared the numbers. And we didn't prepare any of them, did we? So that's an example at the other end of the range from an audit. Auditing, detailed checking, resulting in detailed opinion, high level of assurance. Compilation report, no checking done at all, therefore no assurance given. Now a compilation report is a relatively uh, low importance thing for the exam, but there are plenty of pieces of work that fit somewhere in between the high level audit and the low-level compilation. So let's have a look at these assignments which give a sort of medium level of assurance. There are a number of types of assignment which fit under the general heading of a review. A review is a bit like an audit, except we're going to do less detailed work, and because we're doing less detailed checking, 
we are going to give a less detailed opinion, with less assurance provided. And this lower level of assurance is often referred to as negative assurance. Now the assurance provided can be done in a different way potentially, but negative assurance is quite a neat way in which an accountant can say, I've done some checking and I can give you some assurance, but I just can't give you that much. In an audit, the auditor says that as a result of the work done, the accounts are true and fair, or are not true and fair, or something like that. With a review assignment, on the other hand, because we've not done that detailed work, we've done some, but not as much as an audit, we are not in a position to say, this is the case, or this is not the case. We cannot make such a positive statement. If I were to review a set of accounts rather than auditing them, I will have done enough work that will allow me to say something like this. So notice the format of what I'm saying. Instead of saying, yes, the figures appear to be true and fair, I'm saying, I haven't seen any reason to believe they're not true and fair. Now that's good, isn't it? I haven't seen any problems. The issue is, I've not actually looked that hard, have I? Because I've done less detailed work. It's a bit like if you went to a doctor and said, doctor, am I sick? What you're hoping for the doctor to say is, no, you are not sick but they can only do that if they do a very thorough examination of you. If you go to a doctor and say, Doctor, I know you don't have much time available, but I'm worried I'm sick. Could you give me a quick look over? After a quick looking over, the doctor may be able to say, I haven't seen any reason to believe you are sick. That's not as good, is it, as saying you're not sick, but then he hasn't done a thorough check, so he doesn't know that. So negative assurance gives some assurance, but not as much assurance as an audit does. So when I say less detailed work in a review assignment, what do I actually mean? Well, in an audit, we have five basic types of audit procedure available to us. And of course we met these earlier in the course when we were doing audit testing. Analytical procedures where we compare things with other things. Inquiry and confirmation, where we ask questions and receive responses in writing. Inspecting things like documents, assets. Observing things like an asset working to prove that it does work, or maybe an internal control process happening. And, of course, recalculating things. 
In an audit, we do a whole range of all five of these. With a review assignment, we focus on the less detailed bits. And that's the top two. So instead of looking for lots of pieces of paper, inspecting lots of assets, observing detailed control processes happening and lots of detailed calculations, instead a review process involves asking a few questions, predominantly of management and getting them to confirm things, and using analytical procedures. So in other words, if you handed me a set of figures and said review them, I'd probably compare them with similar figures like last year's, I might compare these figures with forecasts, and I might ask management various questions to try to assess if the numbers look about right. Less detailed work, result, less assurance provided. The next question is, what sort of figures, what sort of things might I review rather than do a full audit on? Well, there are three types of review assignment that I'm going to mention as part of the course. One of them I'm going to mention more for general interest. The other two both come up fairly regularly as questions. Firstly, the one for general interest. As we know, companies get their annual financial statements audited in detail. But the world's biggest companies don't just prepare their figures on a one-year basis, they also bring out figures quarterly. So a big company will produce first quarter, half-year figures, third quarter, final figures. Now it's often the case that when you bring out your half-year figures, there's quite a lot of interest in them. And as a result, your investors may be keen to know that the half-year figures are somewhere close to accurate. You don't need to get them audited, but a lot of companies get these half-year accounts, these interim financial statements, reviewed. Now, of course, there's no real need to audit them in huge amounts of detail, partly because once the year end happens, they will, of course, be audited in detail along with the second half year. OK, so there's one example of a review assignment. But of course, since this is the financial statements, just half a year, the exercise is so similar to a final audit that it's unlikely that the examiner would test this in any detail. The other two areas, though, the other two examples of uh, review assignments come up, as I said, far more frequently. Imagine you are a company and you wish to raise some money, maybe from a bank. When you go to the bank, before they lend you any money, they'll want some idea about how you're going to use it. They'll want to see your forecasts to see what you're going to do with the money and also to assess your financial viability in the future. The problem, of course, is you are the person who's put together the forecasts and naturally the bank might be a little bit suspicious that you've been a little too optimistic. They want to know if they can trust these forecasts as being somewhere close to accurate. The problem, of course, is can you ever describe forecasts, which are just estimates, of course, as being right? Can an estimate ever be right? 
All we can really say is that the estimates look sort of reasonable. So the company might come to you and say, here are my forecasts for the next six months, five years, who knows, and say, could you please check my forecasts and write a little report on them saying that you think they're okay. Realistically, the best we'll be able to do is to assess these forecasts and then give an opinion that says, as a result of our work, we haven't seen anything to suggest that these forecasts are not reasonable. Negative assurance. With forecasts, we provide negative assurance for the simple reason that being estimates, there's probably not enough evidence available to tell how accurate those numbers are. So due to lack of evidence, lack of work, lack of detail, lower level assurance. Now, as I said, these do come up on the exam reasonably frequently, so a little later on, we'll need to look at an example of these and just look at how you might actually do it. The next example is negative assurance, usually for different reasons. Due diligence reviews are carried out in a number of circumstances, but the one that you're probably most familiar with is when company X wants to take over company Y. Before company X parts with its money, it wants to make sure that what it thinks it's buying, it is actually buying. It wants to check out company Y in a bit more detail. So if you were about to part with what could be several hundred million dollars, you'd want to check out this company fairly carefully, wouldn't you? Well, ideally, of course, yes, you would. The problem is you need to move fast. Why move fast? Well, number one, when your competitors find out you're buying this company, maybe they will want to jump in and make a higher bid. So you want to get this sorted out pretty quickly before the deal collapses. And secondly, of course, the value of companies is changing on a regular basis. You might agree a price, do the checking, the due diligence, and then come back and find the price has gone up. So with due diligence reviews, the reason normally that less detailed work is done than a full audit is quite simply the fact that you don't have the time available. You need to move quickly. So there are some examples of review assignments which seem to come up on the exam fairly frequently. Now that we've mentioned those, what we need to do is take a look at some other examples that might also come up on the exam and just have a little think about the issues with those. Once we've gone through that list, there are going to be one or two that we need to look at in a bit more detail. Two of them are actually up on the screen at the moment, the due diligence and the prospective financial information. But there's at least one or two others that we should look at in a little more detail as well. The first of these other services that we need to have a quick look at is actually a service that we've already done in detail on the course. Earlier in the P7 course, we looked at a question called Ferry. And that question was a business risk management question. In this question, we had to identify the risks facing the business, but we weren't the auditors. We weren't doing this because we were analyzing if the financial statements were accurate. We were going to do this to help the company solve its business problems.
Now that is not an audit assignment, and therefore that is a non-audit assignment. So that's actually part of this section of the syllabus. We did it earlier because I wanted you to see this type of risk question up against the other types of risk question relevant to auditing, just so you could see the difference. So the good news is we've dealt with that one already. So look back at the risk part of the videos and you'll see that question called ferry. So that's one example. A second example is quite a modern topical thing, and that is the internet. A lot of companies these days sell their products online, and in order to do that, they have to get customers to type in very private personal details online, like credit card numbers, for example. A lot of people are very nervous about putting that information onto the computer screen, knowing it's then going to fly across cyberspace to the company that they're buying from, and they're worried, therefore, about the security of their personal information. As a result, companies tend to get their websites checked by experts who can tell them if they are secure. Now, those experts, you might assume, are going to be computer experts, and yes, that's probably true, but a lot of big firms of accountants have hired some of these people because what they're doing is effectively an IT audit. Now that's a specialist area and your examiner is not expecting you to know too much about it. All you really need to know are the fairly obvious problems. The danger that websites might be hacked into, that viruses might attach to them, that people might get personal data and be able to remove it. And of course in many countries there is a Data Protection Act, which means that any personal information on that site, if you lose it, you're actually breaking the law as well as upsetting your customers. So that is website security. The next one I'll mention is another very topical area, and that is social and environmental auditing. At the moment in the world, a lot of people are very keen to know whether companies have any corporate social responsibility, CSR. They want to know what companies' performance is like, not just in financial areas, but also social, like how they treat their employees, how they treat their customers, and also, of course, their environmental performance. How much pollution are they pumping out? Uh, are their activities sustainable? And things like this. Now this is a very topical area. We've already had an article in Student Accountant by your examiner on this very topic, so we'll need to look at this one in a bit more detail and make sure that we understand the examiner's article. So that's social and environmental audits. More detail on that one coming up a little bit later. Now let's look at the next one on the list. Of course, as well as providing external audit services, a company might come to you and ask you to be their internal auditor, because a lot of companies choose to outsource this service and get firms of accountants to provide it. You should already be aware of what internal auditors do from your F8 knowledge, and should know that their work centers around checking risk management processes and internal control systems. But we will look at that one in a little more detail just to make sure that you have that knowledge in place.
Forensic investigations are a favourite of your examiner. We've already had a couple of exam questions from her. She's already written at least a couple of articles on this as well, so she clearly likes it very much. Expect this one to come up on the exam quite a lot in the future. Forensics is where we're doing work that is going to be used in a court case. Forensic accounting is where we are providing some numbers that will be used in a, a court case. Forensic auditing is where we are looking for audit evidence that will be used in a court case. For example, a court case judging a potential fraudster. There are all sorts of issues attached to forensic work. Much of it can look very similar to traditional auditing of financial statements, but there are quite a few additional issues and we'll need to look at those in some detail. So there we go. There are some examples of the other assignments that auditors can do. Two things we need to do now. Firstly, we need to look at some general issues that cover any type of assignment. And secondly, we need to look at some of that list in a bit more detail. Firstly, some general points. A common start to an exam question is a company has asked you to do something that might be to become its external auditor or its internal auditor or to check its website security, do a social environmental audit, forensics, etc, etc. And then the question says, what will you consider before deciding whether to accept this assignment? Now, this should be a question that is partly familiar to you. Because on F8, you have to consider the issues that you have to deal with before saying yes to a new audit client. If the assignment is not an external audit, there will be additional issues to consider as well. But before we look at the additional ones, let's remind ourselves of some basics. If someone walked in here now and said, Paul, will you be my external auditor? What would I need to consider before able to say yes? Of course, I need to make sure that I can do this work for an acceptable fee that's going to make me a profit. Secondly, I need to consider if doing work for this client will lead to potential conflicts of interest with other clients. I have some practical issues to consider. Do I have the time to do this work? What are these clients' deadlines? How quickly do I need to do the audit? And have I got the staff and other resources available to do it? Am I competent? Do I understand this client and the industry in which they operate? Is it possible that if I do the audit, this client may offer me other work as well? Subject to independence issues, of course, other work would make this client a lot more attractive to me.
I need to consider, am I independent? Are there any familiarity threats, self-review threats, things like that? Also, if this were an audit, before I say yes, I must try to contact the outgoing auditor to find out if there are any issues that I, as the incoming auditor, need to know about. Some business issues as well. I'd want to assess the ethics of the actual client, the integrity of the directors, for example. The last thing I need is a client who is a crook, a liar, because if they have a bad reputation, it will probably end up sticking to me as well. And a bit of common sense, do you want a client who's going out of business? They might not be able to pay the fees, of course. So there are quite a few examples of the sort of factors I would consider for virtually any assignment I was asked to do, whether it's an audit or anything else. But if it is not auditing their financial statements, it's something else, another type of assignment, there are going to be some additional issues to consider as well. The reason there are additional issues is that in an audit, a lot of things you might want to consider, you don't have to consider because there are rules or standards in place that already tell you the answer. If it's not an audit, it may be that those rules or standards simply don't exist. For example, if it's an audit, I don't have to consider who I'll be reporting to because I'll be reporting to the shareholders. If it's not an audit and the client wants me to write some sort of report about something, who is the report for? In fact, why is this work being done? What is its purpose? With an audit, of course, it's being done because the law says you've got to have it done. If it's not an audit, why are they doing this? What is the point of it? Now that's useful to know because if they're putting together financial forecasts and they're doing it to try and get a bank to lend them money, you know that they've probably made the forecast look too good. So it will affect the way we look at the numbers. With an audit, I also know how much detail I need to do. My work needs to be detailed enough to allow me to provide reasonable assurance in my audit opinion. If it's not an audit, there are probably no rules. So I need to know how much work they want me to do, how much evidence they're going to make available to me. They might not let me see everything, which they're perfectly entitled to do. With an audit, they have to let me see everything. And as a result of all of that, what type of report they want and how much assurance.
Now, those are not the only additional issues. Uh, one or two others I might add at this point would be that when we do an audit, we are checking the financial statements against accounting standards. If I'm not doing an audit and I've been asked to check something, I need to have some sort of criteria to assess that something against. For example, maybe a client says, can you review my internal control system? Okay, I can review it. But what do you want me to check it against? Tell me what you believe is the definition of a good control system. And hopefully the client has set some targets for its control system. For example, how many failures they accept as being okay. I can now check the control system to make sure it's not failing any more than that level. So I need something to check this information against, some level of accuracy. Another thing to consider is how I'm going to do my work. With an audit, I will follow auditing standards. If it's not an audit, there may be no standards at all telling me how to do it. Gradually, as accountancy firms do more and more non-audit work, additional standards are being produced. But they tend to be fairly short and fairly basic. Of course, if there is some professional guidance, I will almost certainly follow it. Because that way, if I ever find myself up in court, being accused of not doing it properly, I can point at those standards and have something to fall back on. So there we go. Some issues when asked to do work. Some of them are fairly basic and just like an audit. But if it's not an audit, other issues come into consideration. And it's that additional list that you need to learn. I'm sure in the exam you can remember some basics that you have to think about before an audit. But that second list, the last thing we've looked at, you need to learn. Now that leaves us in a position that we can now focus on some of these non-audit assignment examples in a bit more detail.